or lay that to you sang the song that you did, The Light of the World is Jesus. You know, we are living in a dark world. We really are. And it's getting darker, not lighter. It's getting darker. I just read something today. It said, Evangelical Church, the, it said, the Evangelical Church is breaking apart. Not the Catholic, not the Orthodox, not the Jehovah's Witness, the Orthodox, uh, the the evangelical churches, but light in a dark world is Jesus. And let's never forget that. He is the light of the world, but he also said, ye are the light of the world. And so, though, if we have Jesus in our hearts and lives, then he is the light of the world through us, and God expects us to shine. We sing that song sometimes, shine, Jesus, shine, and that's beautiful. But you know, there's another enemy uh, that's out there, and it's called Freedom From Religion Foundation. Now, don't get that confused with freedom of religion. There's a huge difference. Freedom from religion means that they want no religion. So they make a sign that looks like a stained glass church window saying, imagine no religion. How wonderful that would be. And can you see all right? Am I in your way? Huh? If you... I want you to be able to see, okay? Um, but that's their, and their, their effort is to obliterate all semblance of religion in the public eye. That's what they, that's their game plan. That's what they're trying to do. And they're well funded. We'll look at some more of that a bit later. But listen to this. The Obama administration informed the Supreme Court that California's ban on same-sex marriage is not giving equal protection under civil rights. So they take a moral issue that they can't touch because of the guarantees that we have in the Constitution and redefine it as a civil right. So now if you refuse to bake a cake for two men that want to get married, they'll sue you. And they'll make life so miserable for you. I mean, the one man in California, I think he's in his third lawsuit over a cake. And I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, have been wasted in this, in this ordeal. But this is what is happening. When, you see, in the 40 years that, that Romania languished under the heavy hand of communism, they had a constitution that's guaranteed religion religious freedom. Did you know that? They were guaranteed religious freedom and all the while they had men languishing in prison. They were being tortured. You ever read Tortured for Christ? There's an example of that. You see, the Constitution is no stronger than the people that interpret it and apply it. So don't rest on the Constitution. You rest in Jesus Christ. That's important for us. Now, a federal judge on November the 6th, 2019, overturned the Trump administration's rule that protected the freedom of conscience of health care workers who are opposed to procedures such as abortion, assisted suicide, and gender change. Now, if you're a nurse or a practitioner working in the hospital, you no longer have, have the guarantee by law to refrain from assisted suicide or abortion or a procedure of sex change. So where's the Constitution now? And you see, this is an encroachment. In fact, I have on my computer, uh, I have a, a, a file called Christian Encroachment. And whenever I see an article that shows me what is happening, how how the, the basis for Christianity in America is being eroded by people like this, then I put it in that file. I've got quite a file accumulated there. However, the Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation. And when a nation is not exalted because of its righteousness, but it, but it, it is sinful and becoming less and less righteous, more and more unrighteous, deeper in sin, you can expect that society to begin spiraling downward. Economically, it's going to spiral downward. And we, you know, we are in this country... <laughs> It has been a blessing for us, and we've been patted on the back so many times. You know, we have sort of gotten used to, uh, become used to this when somebody says, you know, if you want a nice pole building, you get that Mennonite man out there, he'll build you a good one. We like that. Or if you're going to build a house, you get one of those Mennonite contractors. 
Well, one of those Amish contractors, they'll do you a good job, and they're as good as their word. And we've been patted on the back for a couple of generations now. We've gotten got used to that. We just really enjoy it. I got news for you. That's slowly changing. And how good you are and how good your word is and what kind of a craftsman you are is zilched when you oppose same-sex marriage. It, it no longer matters. Well, the United States of America is a nation on the move. And they claim that um, people are in a car going somewhere usually about an hour to an hour and a half per day. Average, national average. And so that gives them time to think. And, that, and it's, a, it's a good time to put something in front of them to help them think about godly things. Two, 25 million people are seeing a gospel billboard every 24 hours. 25 million people are being reminded about God every 24 hours. Now, billboard evangelism has a purpose, and that purpose is to point America to Christ. And we are adamant about that. We want that to be the sum total of our discussions on the phone with these people. So we have a billboard like this one that says, In the beginning, God created. And just this past week, I had a, a man call me, and he just, he just, uh, he called himself a Gnostic, not an agnostic, but a Gnostic. And it, in other words, we know, we study, we know, and therefore, uh, creation is a fallacy. It's not real. We came here by way of evolution. And I said to him, I said, you know, if it took billions of years for, uh, for us to evolve to this point, then why aren't there just uh, scads of new life pop popping out of the ground from the evolutionary process because the billions of years is still progressing? There should be more and more coming out. I told him that when I was a school teacher, uh, I was, uh, everybody was excited because they're getting ready to land on the moon. I said, do you remember that? He said, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I remember that real well. I was teaching school and I was teaching science and we were debating, or not debating, but discussing this thing, you know. So they're going to look for samples of rock or dirt and see if there's any life forms not, not, not living in it, but evidence that there was life living in it. And um, I said, uh, I, I told my students they're not going to find anything. They won't find anything there because there's no life there. Because God created life. Life has got to come from something greater than itself. Life, and I said, you know, everything you ate today comes from something living, right? You can't live without ingesting something that came from life. So our life is interdependent with other forms of life. So when you get to a place where only one form of life popped out of the slime, you know, there's nothing for it to eat. It's going to die. I told my students, if we take a sheet of paper, you know, eight and a half by 11, and we take it up on the moon, and it's sterile, absolutely sterile. And we put, could put Mr. and Mrs. Microbe right in the center of that paper, and we leave them there, and we go away for 25 years, and we come back. You know what we find? Two dead microbes. Why? They've got nothing to eat. There's nothing there to sustain their lives. Uh, he had all kinds of jargon that was way above my head. When you, when you can't explain something, just get big words. People can't understand them anyhow. Well, I had a man call me from Connecticut, and his name was Tom. And um, Tom said, uh, you have false advertisement on your billboards. I said, really? What's that? Well, you have evolution marked out, and evolution is a proven fact. So, you know, that is really false advertisement. And so we had quite the discussions. And he, he said, I am going to call every day till you take that sign down. I got on the phone and I told Christian Aid that. And they said, good, we're going to keep it up there much longer than normal. <laughs> and they did. And for two years, that man called, not every day, but I'd say on average about three times a week. And everybody got tired of hearing Tom rant on and on about evolution. And so they decided to, to channel all his calls to me. And one day, after I had answered his calls, Numerous times. He said, Johnny, why do you always answer the phone when I call this number? And I said, because my phone rings. You know? And uh, 
And, well, I didn't tell him why it rings, I just said it rings. <laughs> well, we sort of became friendly enemies during that time, and we'd talk about other things, and, and we would talk about family, we would talk about children, we'd talk about things like that, and, and then um, he would talk about faith, and I would talk about faith, and I'd share my testimony with him over and over again, and then he faded out of the picture, and four years passed, and we didn't hear anything from Tom anymore, and I often wondered whatever happened to Tom, but I had saved his phone number in my phone with his name, and I just had Tom C.T. for Connecticut. Well, one afternoon, uh, oh, it would have been around 5 o'clock, uh, my phone rang, and I looked at the caller ID, and it said Tom C.T. And I could, after four years, I was excited, and I thought to myself, this is going to be good. Now, how do I do this, you know? So I picked up the phone, and I said, hello, this is Johnny Miller with Gospel Billboards. And he says, Johnny. And I says, yes. And he says, you know who this is? And I said, where are you from? And he says, Connecticut. I said, Tom? And he said, yeah, man, where you been? And I said, right here, where you been? You know? And we got reacquainted. It was really good. And he was excited. He was excited to be able to talk with me once again. And he told me, he said, you know, I lost your number. I lost your number. And, and I flew into Dayton, Ohio, and I had some, some business to do farther west. I rented a car, and I went to my appointment and on my way back I saw a billboard and there was the number and I got it so I'm calling you I said well Tom I'm so glad you called then he got serious he said Johnny do you still believe in that God of yours and I said well yes Tom I really do Johnny what is it going to take for you to not believe in God then I said well Tom it would take an act of God and I thought he was going to choke. <laughs> he sputtered around. He said, that's not even reasonable. But I said, Tom, that's what it would take. He said, what the? And I, said, I said, Tom, I have a question for you. What would it take for you to believe in God? And he was silent. And he was serious. And he said, Johnny, I don't know. I really don't know. And we talked about a few other things, and he came back to that question. He said, you know, you really got me there. I've never thought about that ever. What would it take for me to believe in God? And I wanted so badly for him to say it would take an act of God. And I was going to tell him that God sent Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose from the dead. That was an act of God, but he wouldn't say it. And so we parted with this. I said, Tom, I had an answer for you. The next time you call, I want to hear an answer from you. Okay? He said, okay. And you could tell it really rocked his boat. What would it take for him to believe in God? And that's something that I think we miss. Somehow we think we have to tell people what's right. But you know, you get a lot farther by nudging them uh, with a question. A question that, that will just continue in their mind again and again. There was a man named Art Katz who was a professor in Berkeley, California, one of the most liberal institutions in America. And he, this was back in the 60s. Now, he had a long ponytail and cut off jeans. You know, he was a real hip fella. And he was on, uh, on furlough and he was going through Europe. And in Europe, he saw a sign that said, Gospel. Uh, bookstore, and he thought, huh, huh, those people believe in God. I'm going in. So he went in. Absolute atheist. He goes in there and he walks around uh, these aisles with all these books, and he just looks at them. He, he can hardly believe it. And then uh, he sees a 12-year-old girl, and she has a book, and she's flipping through it. And so he strikes up a conversation with her, kind of tongue-in-cheek, because he, he knows that she has no idea that he's a professor in a prestigious college. And so, uh, after a bit, he says to her, what makes you think that God's real? And that 12-year-old girl glanced up with surprise on her face and said one phrase, I know he's real. He lives in my heart. That's all she said. So simple. And Art Katz steeled himself so he wouldn't burst out laughing at such a ridiculous response. 
But as he left, the Holy Spirit began wearing a groove in his brain. I know he's real. He lives in my heart. I know he's real. He lives in my heart. It went on and on for 24 hours. He could not get that thought out of his head. He said, it finally drove me to my knees. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he said, I couldn't wait to get back to Berkeley and tell my colleagues what had happened to me. And when he did, he lost all his friends in one night. And Art Katz spent the rest of his life being a missionary to missionaries. He went all over the world, spending time building up missionaries, uh, encouraging them, praying with them, spending time with them. If you die tonight, heaven or hell? And you know, we get lots of calls. In fact, this is our number one billboard. We have several versions of it, but heaven or hell? People want to know where they're going. Who is Jesus? Read Matthew's gospel. And we have, I have over 100 atheists that I have, I have challenged. I said, you have an open mind, don't you? Because all atheists have open minds. Didn't you know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're the closed-minded ones. So once they acknowledge that they have an open mind, then I say, oh, well, if you really have an open mind, why don't you start with the book of Matthew, chapter 1, and you go through one chapter a day, have a notebook, tear it apart, write down what you think, uh, it's saying, and it, call me if you have any questions, and um, just go chapter by chapter through the 28 chapters. It only takes about 10 minutes a day, and you're trying to discover who Jesus is, why he came, how he came, and how his life can affect yours. And I've got over 100 atheists that said, I'll, I'll do that. Not one of them have ever called me back, and I don't know where that's going to go. But you know, when the word of God gets into the hands of an atheist, anything can happen. The Holy Bible is inspired. It is absolute and it is final. And we need to, we need to approach it that way. Now, you see that, that billboard number there is 855 Find Truth. And now, if you count those, that's too many digits. So I had a man call me at 12 o'clock midnight one night. And when I answered the phone... <laughs> Uh, I said, hello, Johnny Miller with Gospel Billboards. I woke up, rolled over and answered my phone. And he says, uh, I'm, I'm calling to tell you that y your, your phone number's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, oh, I guess it does. <laughs> <laughs> for I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that is amazing. Can we come to the place where we're not ashamed to speak out? And I believe some of the opposition that is hampering us and, and encroaching upon us is going to make us uh, less ashamed. We're going to stand up and we're going to speak out. Have you lost faith in God? Some people have and they call us on this billboard. On April the 17th, 2020, a federal judge awarded an atheist group, the American Humanist Association, $450,000 after the organization won their lawsuit against the Greenville, South Carolina High School's graduation prayer, probably one of the most expensive prayers in America. $450,000 because someone prayed at the graduation. That's the world we're living in, and it's anti-Christ and we need to prepare ourselves uh, for this wave of anti-Christ sediment that's coming our way Jesus your only way to God and you know we have Christians so called uh, that call us on this I just read a statistic 70% of people who classify themselves as Christians say Jesus is not the only way to Christ Buddha will take you to Christ. Mohammed will take you to Christ. But Peter says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. There is no other. Every knee shall bow, not to Mohammed, not to Buddha, but to Jesus Christ. And every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus can free you from sin. And uh, we have people that call on this billboard. They want freedom. Find peace. Surrender to Jesus. 83 for truth. We altered that so we have the right amount of numbers because too many people were getting confused. 
Now this one is a ripple effect. This man uh, painted his car with a uh, uh, sort of a rainbow of colors, knowing that um, the uh, the homosexual society has tried to take God's symbol of promise and use it for evil. So he paints his car that way, and he puts on the right uh, left front fender, call 83 for truth. And somebody saw this and took a picture of it and sent it to us. I have no idea who the man is. Uh, nobody that, that we would know. Um, and then he has some, some um, biblical truths written on the windows, windows as well. So uh, we are able to inspire others to be more active in, uh, in uh, spreading the gospel. Anxious, Jesus offers rest. And we have, during the COVID thing, uh, you know, and it's not over with yet, but we had many, many people that were very anxious. And I have to tell you about uh, Noah Day. Noah and Michelle were in Missouri, and Ruth and I were going to a funeral there, and he called on the phone, and, uh, and I told him that we're going to be in Missouri uh, the next day for a funeral, and he said, whereabouts? And uh, I had talked to him a couple of times on the phone before that, and he had initially called on a billboard. And so um, I, I said, why don't you come to the funeral? He said, well, I don't know who it is. I said, that makes no difference. I'll be there. Uh, I'll, I'll welcome you, and I'll watch out for you. So um, I got there, and sure enough, he and his wife showed up. And I, I was introduced to them, and I got to speak with them and make friends with them. And since that, that was about five years ago. And since that time, we've had many, many conversations. Well, um, they were expecting their first child after seven years of marriage, and the, the baby was born about a month ago. And four days after that baby was born, a little girl, and they named her Shoshana. Uh, after Shoshana was born, uh, her mother came down with COVID. A severe case, and she was in the hospital in a coma, and Noah would call me, and we would pray, and we would lay that thing before the Lord, and it went on and on, but uh, last, it was a little over a week ago, she died. And he's called me numerous times since, sometimes at 11 o'clock at night, and he's sobbing. If only I would have treated my, life, my, my, my wife as I should have. Uh, he was not the most congenial person, but he is really seeking God now. But at the same time, the devil is out to keep him from it. And someone gave him a... Uh, introduced him to the Gospel of Matthew in original Hebrew. What would you think if you had uh, Gospel of Matthew in original Hebrew? The problem is it's not original. The language is original, but the Gospel isn't. And if you go through it, you'll find discrepancies over and over. And pla any place that says the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is uh, out of it, and the Lord is out of it, and it's just Jesus and some things are totally reversed. Like the rich young ruler that came to Jesus, in that particular passage it says, and he went away sorrowful because he didn't have any, any uh, possessions. Completely opposite of, of what Jesus said. And so beware when people tell you they have an original. It's not an original fact, it was, it was actually uh, printed in 1385 uh, by a man who wrote a thesis against Christianity. He was a Jewish man, and he was writing against Christianity, and in his greater work, he put this translated uh, bogus gospel of Matthew. So we need to be careful. The word of God is, is sure, and we need to stick with it. Uh, are you worried? Jesus offers security. Are you disillusioned? Jesus offers hope. So we have a number of these types of... Uh, of billboards with a man with his hands over his head and people begin to recognize that and when they see the next one with that graphic on they, they read to see what it says next confused jesus offers clarity i had a man call me on this particular message just this past week and uh he said he's really confused and so we we talked at length and uh, tried to untangle his confusion but there was a problem most people who are confused have a horizontal vision. They can't understand 
God. And if they can't understand God, they can't believe in God. You know why? They have no faith. Why don't they have faith? They have no faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And they pushed the Bible away and said the Bible is full of discrepancies. It's written by man. And I said, can you show me some books that weren't written by man? I'd like to see them. Yeah. <laughs> but the instrumentality of man, but the Holy Spirit is the author. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so... Uh, don't let anyone tell you that you can't use the Bible. I've had him tell me that. I was talking to an atheist one day, and he was saying, he, you know, he was trying to get me to come down to his level of unbelief. And he tried very, very hard for about 40 minutes. And then I said, well, you know, I can listen. I have, I'm long-suffering. Really, I am. And I, I can listen for a good while. But after a while, I, you know, something kicks in gear, and it's time for me to move ahead. So I said, well, listen to this. Just, just listen to this for a minute. And I got him to shut up for just a little bit. And I said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was, wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. You're quoting the Bible, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, that's circular reasoning. You can't do that. I said, I know that, but listen to what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's talking about Jesus Christ, and it says, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's Jesus. Now you see, it's stuck in His brain. What's He going to do with it? You know, I had a wonderful unit leader when I was in V.S., and we all worked at the hospital, and uh, Clyde Wagler was asked by his boss to sit down over a cup of coffee. He said, I have some questions for you. Now, he had seen us, 1W boys, working in the hospital, and he could see the difference in, the, in our lives and some of the other employees. And so he was really in question about this. So he comes to Clyde, and he says, so I want to know why you believe what you believe. And Clyde said, well, the word of God says, and he started quoting a, a scripture. And he said, nope, nope, hold it right there. The Bible is not in this discussion at all. I ask you why you believe what you believe, and that's what I want to hear. Clyde says, I guess we're done then. His boss looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, if I can't quote from the word of God, there's no discussion. Now, that sounds kind of rude, doesn't it? But I'm going to tell you something. Why should the unbeliever set the rules by what we can and cannot say? Why, why does the unbeliever tell us that we are not able to use truth to answer their questions? Thy word is truth. Thy word is forever settled in heaven. And we need to be biblicists. And I get calls every day from lesbians. Every day. And they ask me, Am I going to hell because I'm gay? The short answer is yes. I never say that. I don't ever say that. I said, well, you know, it's like this. All of us have a sinful nature. And we cannot take that sinful nature with us to heaven. What would happen if you could take your sinful nature with you to heaven? And so could I, and so could we all. All take our sinful natures with us to heaven. What would heaven become? One lady told me, be like Las Vegas, I guess. <laughs> you know? And God's not going to let that happen. And so we get them to think about that. And I said, so the pr other problem is we are self-centered. If you don't believe that, we'll put a little imaginary uh, playpen in front of us. We got two 18-month-old cousins, and we'll put them in there, and we'll walk by and drop in a bright yellow rubber duck, and then we're going to back off and watch self-centeredness take over. It's right there. They're innocent, but you get, there's not long. There's pulling hair. There's screaming going on. They both want that duck. And the lady said, yeah, I guess that's right. So I said, all of us have that. But you know, self doesn't possess the power to kick self out of self. We have to reach to something higher, and that's Jesus Christ. Did you know that he died for your sins? He paid the penalty for your sins so that you can be redeemed, so that you can be free of the guilt of your sins. And so I'm talking about all of their sins, not just a sin. 
It's not one sin that's going to send you to hell. It's rejecting Jesus Christ's redemption from all sin that's going to send you to hell. And I share that with them. I had one lady who said I'm gay. She said, I've been to church all my life. I've never heard that before. So they had this vague idea that if I sin and I confess it, God will forgive me and I just keep on going. I sin again, I confess it, I just keep on sinning and confessing. That's not deliverance, my friend. Uh, deliverance is when we come to Jesus Christ and we're forgiven and cleansed and his Holy Spirit within us keeps us from sinning and we move ahead in life uh, worshiping and serving Almighty God. Concern Jesus can be trusted. He can. He can be trusted with our lives. And I keep telling people, they, they talk about blind faith. You ever hear that term? Blind faith. Uh, or the leap of faith. You know, that's not what it is. True faith has in it an entrustment. They say, what do you mean? That you entrust your sins of the past to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, ins you entrust your sinfulness of the present to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you entrust your life and future to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's entrustment. That's real faith. And faith without entrustment is simply a, a, a mental assent. Yes, people say, I'm a Christian. I believe that God is in heaven. I believe he sent Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross. I believe he rose from the dead for my sins. And so I'm a Christian. But their life is not Christ-like. I've talked to so many atheists. You can hear that they grew up in a church. They know too much Bible. And you can hear it. But something happened in church that discouraged them. They saw some inconsistencies. And they've turned away from God. And they're living an ungodly life. And so when I hear that, I began probing a little bit. <clears throat> and I ask them. I ask them this. I say, um, you know, we don't agree on anything. They believe in evolution. They think Jesus was just a prophet. And then I say this. <clears throat> I say, um, you know, um, if Jesus Christ were walking the streets of America today, I believe he would condemn about 90% of everything that's called Christian because it's not Christ-like. And almost invariably, I hear the atheists say, you got that right. So there's where we agree. <laughs> but that's a sad commentary, isn't it? But it tells us where America is as a nation. Uh, and I think that should sober us. Shackled by lust, Jesus sets you free. I don't know how many calls we've had on this one of people who, uh, young men in particular, who are cap captured by pornography. And they want, they want free. But I had the blessed privilege um, on uh, Good Friday, a 19-year-old called me from Texas. And uh, he said, I, I, I'm just addicted to porn. I've been, I've been since I'm 13 years old. And, and I, I want out. I, I, I know I, I've stopped going to church. I want to get back. I want to get back with God. Can you help me? And I said, sure. Let's, uh, I'll send you some literature. I'll send you some CDs. Uh, we have some things that can be a great help to you, but I want to pray with you. And he said, sure. So I prayed with him, and he prayed a faltering prayer, and that was Good Friday. Easter Sunday, he called me again. And this time he was weeping. And he said he's, he just is so addicted, he can't, he can't shake it. And I said, well, you need to make a commitment to Christ. You really do. And we prayed again. On Tuesday following Easter, I'm in a minister's meeting, and minister's meetings, if you're a minister, you know, you know they're pretty important, and uh, yeah. But my phone rang, and I looked at it, and it had his name on it. And uh, what do I do? I said, excuse me, I I've got to answer this call. And I hopped out of the meeting, and I answered the call. I was on that call for 20 minutes, and when I came back to that meeting, I said, brethren, there's a new babe born into the kingdom of God. He opened his heart to the Lord. And all because he saw a billboard, and that started a chain of events that brought him into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And I have kept in contact with him. He, he calls me pretty regularly. And has he been absolutely clear since? No. 
But every time that, that he has a problem, he calls me. Uh, we have prayer together. And I said, call me preventively. Don't call me after you've fallen. I want to know when you're being tempted. And uh, let's work together. I want to walk beside you. He's going to church again. And so, um, yeah, I just really appreciate those kinds of calls. Well, one evening I had a group of young people call me. And in the course of conversation, they wanted to know if we have anything about homosexuality. It seemed like their leaders were leaning more leniently in that direction because it's politically correct. And um, on earth, that is. And, uh, and yet they're not, they, they weren't comfortable with it. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll send you something. And I went the next day and I looked at every tract I had, every book that I had, every CD I had, and we had absolutely zero on the subject of homosexuality. So here we are, a nation that's being hit by a tidal wave of this type of immorality, and we're not speaking to it. So I got out the owner's manual called the B-I-B-L-E, and I started searching and put together a study on the subject of morality, including homosexuality, or zeroing in on that. And so I have some of these with me tonight, and I want you to take several of them because you're going to have neighbors that are going to ask you the question, people that you meet, uh, they're going to ask you about this. Uh, where do you stand on this? And here is a concise uh, little pamphlet. It will almost fit in your shirt pocket. And it will, um, it will outline the basic uh, scriptures, Old and New Testament, where you can point to them. This is what the Bible says. And we had uh, a meeting with uh, Liberty University's legal team. And they advised us, uh, when this issue really became a hot-button issue, uh, how do we answer this to keep from having, uh, you know, like uh, somebody getting mad at us and suing us? And they said, always oh, stick with the Word of God. If they want to sue the Bible, go ahead. That's up to them. You know, but uh, don't, don't, don't uh, uh, give your opinion. Give what the Bible says. So I had a lady, and that was fresh in my mind, this lady called me says, um, I want to know where you stand on same-sex marriage. And I said, uh, well, in the Bible it said, no, 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 I want to know your opinion. I said, my opinion is what the Bible says, and the Bible says that in the beginning God made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's what the Bible says. And so, of course, I believe that. She didn't stick on the phone very long. Now, this was one of those little adult stores out there in Pennsylvania, and uh, they were doing a business. And then we had the opportunity to put up that sign over there on the right-hand side, Lust Destroys, Jesus Saves. And it was about six months later, there was a for sale sign went up in, this, in the front of this building. Yeah. And, and it was sold to a Mennonite man who has converted it into... A, a place where he sells his lawn furniture. And uh, we are just <laughs> blessed by that. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the gospel works. It really does. And we should never be ashamed of it. Jesus offers you a new life. And um, we want people to realize that instead of groveling around in the dirt, you know, we can actually um, we can, uh, soar in the skies. Beyond reasonable doubt, Jesus is alive. And uh, we have people that uh, just, I, sometimes they, they call and say, um, yeah, you're, I, I'm going to talk with Jesus. Is this Jesus? I said, no, I'm just one of his workers. Well, put him on the line. I want to talk to Jesus. I said, okay, no problem. You ready to pray, sir? And he says, yeah. I said, okay, I'll pray with you. You pray first. Click. <laughs> It helps to have a little sense of humor if you're answering the phone calls all the day, all day long. <laughs> Real Christians love their enemies. We've had some people that just, they don't know what to do with this. But that's true. And uh, right now, you know, we have a real test going on in Haiti. How can we love those who are so filled with hate? How can we, in truth, love those who are anti-truth, anti-Christ? 
There's evidence for God. I love this one. And we get many, many calls. Um, and they're looking for they're looking for physical evidence. So I asked one man, so you're looking for physical evidence of a spirit God. Because Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we have to look at the evidence that's pointing toward the truth. And I like to take them to Hebrews chapter 11 and point out this. And I tell them this little story. I have a nephew who today is a lawyer writing multi-million dollar contracts with uh, huge corporations all over the United States. That's his job. And when he was in college, he was sort of weighed down with the weight of his importance. And poor little me didn't stand a chance when we got into a debate of any kind. Now he claimed to be a Christian, but one, one evening when uh, the whole family was together, there's about, well, I don't know, probably 15 of us sitting in one room, <clears throat> and he's, he dangles his bait out there and he says, Johnny, you know, faith is abstract. Now, I know from a literal definition that's true, but not from a spiritual definition, and I didn't like his, his connotation there, so I thought, well, you know what? Two can play this game. I'll bait him back. So I said, what is faith? And he went right where I hoped he would go. He went right to Hebrews 11, and he started quoting, and he said, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and I said, excuse me? And he said it again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence, I says, how's that? And the third time I did it, he caught on. There's nothing wrong with my hearing. <laughs> I wanted him to understand what he's saying. Faith is a belief in that which has substance, and there's evidence pointing to that substance. Without the substance of God being there, our faith is vain. Our faith is just so much intellectual <coughs> exercise. But when there is substance there and there's evidence in our hearts and in the word of God, then we have faith that works. And so I like to share that when people call wanting to know about the evidence. Uh, we have many discussions. But I said, oh, that's the one with the little baby on it, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, <clears throat> all of us got here the same way. Did you know that? Every one of us were born. And do you know that while we were being uh, developed in our, in our mother's body, the right side of our heart was the high pressure side, the left side was the low pressure side, and between the two was an opening and there was a bypass there and the blood was not flowing through our lungs like it is now. It was bypassing and, and because it was getting the nutrients and oxygen from our mother's blood through the placenta without intermingling the bloods. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? And then it came into our system, and our heart, little heart was just pumping away in, in our own system through that little bypass. And then a doctor told me that as the baby comes out of the birth canal and takes its first breath, in 10 seconds, that heart flips. Boop, and the left side becomes the high-pressure side, the right side the low-pressure side, and the little flap goes over the opening with enzymes to grow fast. Now you're pumping through your lungs because you are oxygenating your own blood through your breathing. And I said, you know, if that was a process of evolution, even if it just took 500 years, there'd be no humans on planet Earth because we'd all die. We have to, it's gotta work and it's gotta work right. And so that's a design. And where there's a design, there's always a designer. I asked him, I said, you know, you go down to a river, and you find there a rock about the size of a basketball, and on top of that, one about the size of a softball, and on top of that, one about the size of a golf ball. You know what that means? Somebody was there before you were. Wouldn't you think that? And he says, yeah. <laughs> so anytime you see a design, there's got to be a designer. And so there's evidence for God all over one of the things I like to ask them is, do atoms have babies? And they go, Adam? Adam? No, I said, atoms. Oh, atoms? No, no, I don't think they do. I said, isn't that amazing? The whole universe is made out of atoms. Well, we don't know where they came from. And they're intricate. They have matter, they have space, and they have energy, and the energy doesn't seem to be winding down. 
And if they are not procreating, then they were all made. And the things that we see are made from things that do not appear. <laughs> and that's evidence of God. Now, if we take that in the other direction, and we take a far-seeing telescope, and we look out there, 13.4 uh, billion light years, and we see a galaxy out there. And in that galaxy, no doubt, there's planetary systems like ours, where there's a nucleus or a big star, and we have planets revolving around that, and it has matter, and it has energy, and, and it has space. I think it's the fingerprint of God in the minute and in the major. And so we are uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. After you die, you will meet God. There's a man that took issue with that, and I'm going to see if he can talk to us tonight. Are we on? Let's try again. Well, I guess he's, he's scared. I just want to know how you know. How do you know for sure that you'll meet God when your life is over? Uh -huh. So people ask these kinds of questions. How do you know that you're going to meet God when your life is over? Well, you say the Bible says so. They say, well, I don't believe the Bible. I say, but that doesn't change anything. I told one atheist this. I said, you know, you're going to die one of these days. And they're going to bury you. And you're going to be, your body's going to be down there. And then one day you're going to hear. You're going to hear a voice. It's going to be the voice of the Son of Man. And your body's going to start moving, and you're going to come up out of that grave, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And you're going to have a different body than you went in with. The Bible says we have a, an everlasting body after this life is over, after we're resurrected. And I believe that's for saint and sinner alike, because in hell, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And I told him, I said, and then you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and you're going to kneel down and you're going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But it's going to be too late. Yeah. In 2008, we had 11 billboards. We were excited. We had 11 billboards. And, uh, and now we had one man could take care of all the calls. And that man was Raymond Bartman. Now, we have well over a thousand billboards scattered across the United States. And they're asking questions like this. Is Jesus real? How would you answer that? You'd say, well, yes. How do you know he's real? Have you seen him? Has he spoken with you? Those are the questions they shoot at you. And I tell him, yes, he's spoken to me. I, in fact, I'm in, I'm in communication with Jesus all the time. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And he says, oh, what did he say? You heard him with your ears. No, no, no. I say, you hear him with your heart. That's not possible. I say, oh, yes, it is. You see, here's what it is. I said, you and I are here. We're on cell phones right now. I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. And it's going through cell towers. We have a system. We can talk together. But right at the same time that this is happening, we are being bombarded by thousands and thousands of other phone calls, but we don't have a receiver for those, therefore we don't hear them. And because you don't have a receiver for God, you can't hear God. But when you become born again by the Spirit of God, then the Holy Spirit is within you. Now you have a receiver, and you can get the message from God into your heart and life. And you can follow Him. Jesus is real. And then I've told you about this. And hello, is this Jesus? You know, they get, they're, they, they're just mocking. And sometimes, you know, I get them settled down enough that we can have a reasonable conversation. Prove to me that there is a God I want to believe. I've heard this many, many times. You know what? They're lying. They're lying. They don't want to believe. And anything that you can share with them so that they could believe, they reject immediately. They don't want to believe. That's why they say, prove to me that there is a God. But you know, I tell them like this. I can't prove to you that there's a God. Well, I didn't think you could. But here's, I said, but here's why. You see, here's what Jesus says. He says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see, which means perceive, the kingdom of God. And you want to see the kingdom of God before you're ready to be born again. That's the reverse. You can't do it that way. You have to reach out for God. 
and be born again before you can perceive and know the kingdom of God. But evolution is a proven fact. You know, it wasn't when I was a boy in school, but that's a long time ago. They proved it since then, huh? I'd say, really? And they'll tell you about the whales that used to walk on land. I said, that's amazing. I've been on the beach and saw a dead whale there because once they get stranded, they can't breathe anymore. They suffocate because their body is not made to be resting on the, sand, on the, on the ground. Now, evolution is not a proven fact at all. Now, we have to understand the term. There is a thing called microevolution, which is a misnomer because uh, it means uh, things change over time, okay? Well, you know, we have cabbage, and we eat that ball of leaves that's a head of cabbage. Uh, we also have kohlrabi that you can eat, and that's the bulb on the stem. Or we have Brussels sprouts with little bitty cabbages all over the plant. And, uh, and, you know, these are the same DNA plant. We've bred them to do different things but they'll never become orange trees or apple trees or oak trees. They're gonna stay in the cabbage family. And that's what I explain to people. And canines are the same way. God didn't make Dalmatians and poodles and, and Dachshun, dachshunds. He made two canines with enough DNA difference to make all those different kinds of dogs. Equines are the same. Zebra, 36 inch horses, Belgians. They're all equines and they'll never go out of that. And the same thing is true of bovines. You know, you have everything from buffalo uh, all the way down to Brahma. Uh, but they're all bovines. I'm a good person. I really want to serve God. Can I do that and still be gay? I had a lady call me on this just a week and a half ago. And she was so serious. I go to church. I'm very active in my church. And I want to know if that's going to make me go to hell just because I'm gay. And so I began explaining to her that here's what Jesus said. In the beginning, God made them male and female. I said, that's God's design. And if you're not following God's design, you're going to have to answer to the designer. You know what she did? This is what she did. I gave her the scriptures, and she cursed me with the most vile curses you ever heard. Uh-huh. Good Christian, yeah? You see... When you cross someone in their sin, they either receive it or reject it. And she rejected it. What do I need to do in order to go to hell? I've had people call me and say that. And I mean, they are mocking. But they say, what do I need to do to go to hell? And I say, nothing. And they say, what? I said, nothing. Do nothing, you'll get there. You have to be saved from your sins in order not to go there. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What do I have to do to be born again? I love that one. And then we have a big, long discussion of what it takes to be born again by the Spirit of God. And we want to lead them in prayer and help them truly become right with God. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Are we starting in Jerusalem? You know, I believe we need billboards for Jerusalem. And the reason for that is, is because right in the middle of Jerusalem is the USA. Here's where we start. Here's where people know us. Here's where we have a testimony that makes our words have power. And so we need to start at home. Now, I have people that call and say, thank you. You've given me a lot to think about. Others say, nobody has prayed for me like that in many years. They're touched by prayer. I've, I had an atheist that uh, talked to me for quite a while. And at the end, I, I just, I don't know why I did. I just felt I should ask him if I could pray for him. And he paused for a little bit and he said, I, I guess. And you know, it's amazing what kind of salvation you can put in a little prayer. So you say, start with Matthew. Okay, I'll do that. And the reason we do that is because Matthew wrote his gospel in chronological order. And I just had a, a man um, this past week that I told him, start Matthew. And once you've worked your way through Matthew, then go to John. Because John is writing by theme instead of by chronological order. And you get the best of both. Uh, it's a way to build a foundation to your life. And here's the problem. In America today, this generation has no foundation. 
There's nothing there. They have no biblical worldview. They have hardly no concept of God. Now, Lester Bauman, before he passed on, wrote us a study guide for the book of Matthew to send to these people who have agreed to uh, begin studying in the book of Matthew. So we've sent them out to quite a few people. In March, on March the 3rd, Virginia's governor signed a legislation banning therapy for minors, which involves trying to change the individual's homosexual orientation by using counseling and spiritual intervention. Pastors, you're in trouble if you're in Virginia. That's just one state. But these kinds of things are the encroachment that is coming where we are forbidden to use spiritual means to help a person who says, I have same-sex attraction, I don't like it, I want help, can you help me? And if he's under age and you use spiritual intervention, you can be liable by the state government. One dollar presents the gospel message 1,100 times. That's what it figures out to. Billboards are expensive, but that's how it figures out. And... Uh, you know, we had a, uh, a man came to me after a meeting like this. He said, did my son bring you $5? And I said, yes, somebody did. I guess it was your son. Yeah, he's eight years old. You know, he said we were married for 19 years, and uh, we were unable to have children. Uh, we doctored. We did everything we knew to do, but we just weren't blessed with children. And so we gave up on that. And then my, my wife wasn't feeling good, and she went in for a checkup, and they drew some blood and were doing some tests, and... They decided she needed a DNC, so she, they made an appointment. The next day, the, the, the clinic called and said, uh, and they kind of tiptoed around and asked some questions, and, and eventually they asked, are, are you expecting? She said, of course not. We've been married for 19 years, and we don't have any children. We're unable to have children. Well, would you come back in? We want to do a test. So she went back in. They did a pregnancy test, and she was expecting and they thought, here is a religious woman that's trying to get an abortion in a sly way. And that's why they were calling back. And that wasn't the case at all. So anyhow, this little boy was sitting beside his daddy. When he saw the sign flash up like this, one dollar presents the gospel message 1,100 times. He leaned over to his dad and said, Dad, I have some money at home. If I would give... Three dollars, how many people could see the gospel then? And his daddy said, well, it would be 3,300 people. Dad, I, I don't have it with me. Can I borrow it from you? And then I'll give it tonight. And then when I get home, I'll give you the money back. And dad said, okay, okay. Went on with the program. And the little boy sat there thinking. Pretty soon he leans over and says, uh, Dad, how much would five dollars buy? And he said, well, five dollars would be 5,500. Uh, but I'll... I'll the dad looked in his pocket. He had a $5 bill, but he didn't have three. So he said, I'll give you the five, and you just forget about it. You don't have to pay me back. And the boy said, okay. And so um, he comes to me, and he hands me the $5 bill. There he is, you know. I didn't know it when I took this picture. I didn't know his story. But he's a little boy that was born after 19 years of marriage. <laughs> so this is amazing. Uh, here's a little, a little boy that's a, a worker for Jesus. Yeah. And here are the people that um, we need prayer for. Uh, this one needs to be updated a bit. Uh, we, can't, we have a hard time keeping up with it because it keeps changing. Uh, Lester Bauman is still on there, although he's home in glory. Um, yes, these are the people that are on the front line. You need to pray for them. Glad we have uh, Linford Bontrager here with us this evening. And uh, you need to pray for him uh, because he's one of the front line men too. We have a wonderful opportunity to point America to Christ. 25 million people see a gospel billboard message each and every day. We're expecting roughly 150,000 calls through the gospel billboards in 2021. Some are being saved right over the phone. Thousands are being reminded of God and eternity every day. We had a man that harassed us for two months from Washington State. Two solid months, he would call almost every day, and just give us a hard time. And he would talk with different ones of us. 
And um, then he faded out of the picture, and four years passed, and then he called back. And here's what he said. You know, folks, it was not the message on the billboard, and it wasn't just what you told me, but your attitude. You listened to me when I was nasty. And, you know, that changed the, the direction of my feet, and today I am a born-again child of God, and I thought, I need to call those people back and thank them. And he did. And so we had... We've had that. I had a woman call back after six years. So there's just amazing the impact that this has. How much longer will we have the freedom to post these gospel messages with the encroachment I've been telling you about? I don't know. But there's truckers, many truckers that call. And we have a trucker's packet. We send them with CDs that they can listen to as they travel, preaching. Uh, we have a set of C CDs called The Kingdom Now. It's about the kingdom of this world versus the kingdom of heaven. Here's a man that was saved, and Ernest led him to the Lord. This man said, I'm going to hell, and I know it. There's nothing I can do about it. And Ernest says, why do you say that? You don't understand the mercy and grace of God. You don't understand the power of salvation. And Ernest began preaching to him, and that man pulled his 18-wheeler off the road and got saved. Then he left from Missouri, and he drove all the way to South Carolina, and he, he and his wife together, and they spent a whole weekend there with Ernest and Mary Ellen. Uh, and they had Bible study. They had prayer together. They, they blended their marriage back together and renewed their marriage vows. And that man is a ball of fire. He is constantly with tracks in his pocket, passing it out, showing others what Christ did for him. But there are millions, millions of people and the Bible says, likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And there have been many that have repented. We send out CD messages. We like for them to listen. We send out gospel literature, booklets, meaty uh, tracts, uh, and we tailor them for their particular need. Uh, we send out Bibles. We send out Bible storybooks. And here's a question. How can you be involved? Um, in your packet, you have a Billboard Evangelism newsletter. The only way you get that from CAM is if you sign up for it. And I have a sign-up sheet if you want that. There are sponsorships uh, for billboards that uh, are available as well. And sometimes individuals, sometimes businesses, sometimes several individuals, sometimes churches will sponsor a billboard. And we have this, and I have a little clip I'm going to play for you. Uh, how many of you get the prayer alerts that come on your phone? Raise your hand. Okay, what about the rest of you? Thank you. I'm glad you're, you're there. But you see, here's what you This need. is a prayer alert with name. Let's, let's get that back, back in our category here. This is a prayer alert with name changed. Elaine was raised in a breakaway Mormon setting. She and her husband have a large family together. Although she is now back with her husband, there were times when she was unfaithful and is now being pursued by her former partner. A turning point came as she prayed, Oh God, deliver me from the evil forces that have been a part of my life. And she began studying the New Testament. She called our billboard number seeking advice. Elaine is confused, has been battling depression, and even once became suicidal. She realizes that the Bible forbids divorce and yet is appalled by the occult practices of the religious community in which they live. Elaine wants out of this cult, but desperately needs the power of God and His direction to break this bondage. Pray that the Spirit of the living God will become the redeeming force of Elaine's life, that she will be saved, and through her walk with the Lord, her husband and children would also come to know the delivering power of Christ. And God bless you for praying. So a, bill, uh, a, 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 um, a person that's called on the billboard with an urgent need in their life like this is put out about once a week uh, a message just like this one. And uh, if you get it on your phone, if you sign up tonight to get it to your phone, you can get one or two numbers, mama's number, daddy's number. Uh, it's amazing what that does for you as you realize there are people that have great needs in their life that need your prayers. And uh, I, found, I find it very, very 
intriguing. So uh, the sign-up sheet looks like this, and if you would like to have the prayer alerts, you check the red box and put in one or two phone numbers. If you would like for it to come on a uh, email, they're not as urgent, but they come out once a week also, uh, you can do that. If you'd like to have the quarterly newsletter like you have in your packet come to you every quarter, and always it has a couple of stories in it about um, someone who is called, and it's very interesting to see what happens. Then you check the blue box and put in your address. And elderly people say, you know what, I can't go on the mission field anymore. Too many aches and pains, too old, uh, but I can pray. And so they find this as a tremendous outlet for their, um, their spiritual energies. And then young people say, I'm going to get in on the ground floor. I, I, want to, I want to make this a part of my life. And they become active in praying. And it, it challenges them to be active as they work with other people and pray. Whole families uh, use this in their devotional time. And they remember to pray for that individual for an entire week, night after night. And that's something you might consider as well. So if you'd like that, you can sign up for it. So w one thing we don't know is how long we'll be able to continue. The Bible says, the night cometh when no man can work. So I'd like to have us realize that the light of the world is Jesus. Amen. All right, let's have the lights back on. <coughs> so on the table, uh, I'd like for you, we brought things for you. Uh, here is the um, little pamphlet on how to approach someone uh, who is questioning homosexuality. And then we have uh, a number of CDs. Here's one that says, what is truth? That's number 10 out there. It's on the table. What is truth? Because many people are asking today, what is truth? Is truth something that you can actually bank on? Is there such a thing? They're so t totally confused. Uh, why is there evil in the world? Number seven. Uh, that's out there as well. And uh, so we're giving biblical answers to that question. And here's another one. Um, does the moral law point to God? And this one is number six that's out there, out there on the table. We have several others out there. And children, I want you to look up here. All the children look up here. I got a little something for you. Uh, if you don't have this in your home, you want to ask Daddy to pick you up one, okay? It's called Greasy the Robber. It's a story. It's about an hour and 45 minutes long about a little boy that ran away from an orphanage back in the 1800s. And he woke up after sleeping in the forest, and he was surrounded by bandits, robbers. And they caught him, and they took him, and they taught him to be a, a robber. And he was a ruthless robber. He even killed people. And then one day he found a Bible. And he started reading the Bible. And the rest of it, you just have to listen to it to see what happened. Very interesting. And for those of you that didn't get the new book catalog, I have some new book catalogs from Cam out there on the table. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'll turn the time over to Brother Wendell. I'll be back at the table for your questions. It's too late to ask questions now. Thank you.